This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you're enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. All right, this is going to be Chapter 8, Therapeutic Drug Classifications. And introduction. The classification of a drug is the pharmacological class in which the drug has been assigned. Understanding the drug classification should make it easier to rationalize and understand when to use a drug, its contraindications, and precautions. The drug classification contained in this chapter are broad-based and cover many subclassifications that are covered under the individual drugs. And the first ones we're going to talk about here, and these are therapeutic drug classes, are all of the ones that are listed here in front of you, from alkylating agents to antipsychotic. So alkylating agents, uh, they pretty much donate an alkali radical, uh, carbonium ion, in the place of a hydrogen atom to biologically important macromolecules resulting in inactivation of that molecule and halting cell division. Now, if you think about it, why would we want to halt cell division? And the simple answer is because of cancers. So alkylating agents would be chemotype drugs that we would give for specific types of cancer. Alpha-1 adrenergic blocking drugs. Now, we have four receptor sites in the adrenergic nervous system. These are alpha-1, alpha-2, sorry about that, I kind of butchered that one up, beta-1 and beta-2. Speaking about the alphas, I had said once before in some uh, lectures that this is vascular. And betas are muscle, what they're known for. Alpha-1 causes vessels that are this size to be vessels that are this size. So it constricts vascular beds. So mechanism of action. that the They block postsynaptic alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, resulting in dilation of both arterioles and veins. And very simply, why would we want to dilate out somebody's veins? And the indication for this medication is hypertension. Most of our drugs are metabolized to the liver and eliminated in the kidneys. There's going to be some special ones out there. Um, but very simply, <clears throat> if they have impaired hepatic function, you're going to creep in on your drug, and then the half-life on this stuff is going to be sticking around forever. EMS considerations, uh, monitor EKG, assess heart and lungs, vasospastic angina, or orthostatic hypotension, whenever you are dilate somebody out, they can have a vasospasm that gives them chest pain. And then the orthostatic hypotension, every time I stand up, I can't maintain my blood pressure. An amoebicide or trichomonocide. An amoebicide is a drug that kills an amoeba. A trichomonocide is anything that kills trichomonads. Uh, EMS consideration on these are none. You'll find patients that are taking these, though. An amnioglycoside, <clears throat> this is a type of antibiotic, more specifically, whenever we look at antibiotics, genomycin and tobramycin. Genomycin and tobramycin are two of the antibiotics that are in this category. These broad-spectrum antibiotics are believed to inhibit protein synthesis to binding and binding irreversibly to ribosomes, leading to the production of non-functional proteins. Now, this would stop the proliferation of the bacteria. This is indicated for gram-negative bacteria in the bone and joints, people that are septicemic or have sepsis, skin and soft infections, respiratory tract, interabdominal, and postoperative infections. So any kind of infection that we don't want to get out of hand. Contraindications are hypersensitivity to the drug. If they're allergic to it, you're not going to give it. Uh, precautions, renal impairment, hearing impairment, uh, infants and older patients, 
This pretty much stresses the body pretty good. EMS considerations, watch for allergic reaction and any untoward effects when given with muscle relaxants. And they just have um, respiratory depression, laryngeal edema can happen, um, autotoxicity, you can get tinnitus. So if they have hearing impairment, you can get ringing in your ears. Amphetamines and derivatives. Um, this is speed, essentially. Acts as a central nervous system stimulant, causing an increase in motor activity, mental alertness, and causing slight euphoric effects. Indication, narcolepsy or mental depression. Contraindications, if they're already souped up on their own thyroid, hyperthyroidism, diabetic patients, hypertensive, narrow angle glaucoma. If they have chest pain and you speed things up, that's probably not going to be fruitful and cardiovascular disease. Now these are probably not absolute, but they should sure be considered. Uh, precautions in the elderly and psychopathic personality traits. Uh, if you were psychotic and I give you a bunch of amphetamines, that sure wouldn't be a combination to be around. Uh, EMS considerations, watch their EKG vital signs and watch out for any kind of arrhythmias because if we give you a bunch of gas, very, very simply, we can sure speed things up. Uh, tachycardia, hypertension, cardiovascular changes with psychotic syndrome may indicate toxicity. Angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE inhibitors. Mechanism of action. They're drugs that convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. The process occurs in the lungs, resulting in a decrease in blood pressure. Now, pretty simple here, angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin 1 from the release of renin. Uh, it circulates around the body and the capillary alveolar sac of the lungs. This is the capillaries that are around the alveolar sac. This is where ACE is located at, so angiotensin 1 comes into here. When it leaves, it's converted by ACE to angiotensin 2. Now, what angiotensin 2 does is it takes very large vascular beds and makes them very small. It's a vasoconstrictor. So, pretty simple on this. If we stop angiotensin 1 from converting to angiotensin 2, that we'll get a decrease in blood pressure. So... We give this to patient in the treatment of hypertension or congestive heart failure, and this would be when they were, they were backed up, again, trying to decrease some of the vascular constricting, and then left ventricular dysfunction. Contraindications, angioedema caused by previous ACE treatments or ACE inhibitors. So if you've already had an allergic reaction to where your tongue swole or your face swole up or the upper airway swole up pretty good, we probably don't want you on an ACE inhibitor anymore. Precautions, second and third trimester pregnancies. Geriatric patients may have profound side effects. EMS consideration, uh, blood pressure would be a consideration. Angioedema or swelling of the tongue and upper airway. And then airway obstruction. Anti-anemic drugs. Uh, mechanism of action. Anemia is a deficiency in the number of red blood cells of, heme of the hemoglobin molecule. There are two types of anemia, one, iron deficiency, and two, megaloblastic anemia. And this is a deficient in the product, production of blood cells. Now, we can attack this one of two ways. We can give them iron. This would be an anti-anemic drug. Or we can actually give them something like Procrit. Now, Procrit would um, increase EPO production or erythropoietin hormone, which would make your bone marrow make more red blood cells. Indications on this, prophylactically for the treatment of iron deficiencies and iron deficiency anemias. Contraindications, peptic ulcer, ulcerative colitis, cirrhosis of the liver, or in patients with normal iron, iron balance. Uh, if they have a normal iron balance, you pretty much don't want to put extra in. The liver would be an important player in the production of red blood cells. And the elimination of byproducts of destruction of red blood cells. And then... Iron can be upsetting to the stomach, so any kind of peptic ulcer disease or any kind of uh, intestinal inflammation, probably not a good idea. EMS considerations, eggs, milk, and tea can inhibit absorption of dietary iron. Ingestion of calcium in iron supplements can decrease iron absorption as well. 
do not crush or chew sustained release anti-anemic drugs, and that's because they'll get all the iron at once. It could make them toxic. Anti-anginal drugs or nitrates. Uh, mechanism of action, nitrate and nitrates relax the vascular smooth muscle and decrease venous return to the heart. Uh, decrease preload, reduce oxygen requirements of the heart. Diastolic and systolic blood pressure is decreased. That's because it's kind of a vasodilator. Vasodilator, very simply, uh, reduces the amount of the preload, makes the container larger, and thereby reduces overall blood pressure. Fortunately for us, it also dilates the coronary arteries. So if you're having chest pain, nitrates are probably a good thing, as long as you have the blood pressure to, to uh, keep perfusion up. Indications, acute anginal pain or chest pain, first-line treatment for unstable angina as well. Contraindications, sensitivity, uh, severe anemia, heart traumatic postural hypertension, um, close angle glaucoma, impaired hepatic function, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypotension, or recent MI. And the recent MI would be left, uh, left ventricular dysfunction or hypotension with that MI. Uh, if they have chest pain, the easiest solution is to give them uh, nitrates. Uh, EMS considerations on this are going to pretty much be uh, just watch for any untoward effects and be sure that they have ample uh, blood pressure. Uh, signs and symptoms and effects on this, as far as the CNS activity, it can give you headache, dizziness, and restlessness. Uh, as far as cardiovascular, postural hypotension, angina, tachycardia, palpitations, paradoxic bradycardia, PVCs, and arrhythmias. It can give you diarrhea, dry mouth, and abdominal in the GI, and perspiration, muscle twitching, and blurred vision just in general. Watch for any allergic reactions. Uh, we're fixing to start talking about antiarrhythmic drugs, and what this is in front of you is the cardiac cycle. Now, I just want to go over a couple areas because we're going to attack this here in a second or this is how we actually uh, uh, attack the heart, if you will. So, in the middle of this, there is a QRS. Now, what happens is, is this is threshold right here, that the cells have attained threshold. So, in phase zero, we get an influx or a rush inside of the cell of sodium. And in phase one, potassium and chloride are out so this is what allows a more positive substance to increase the action potential of the actual cellular membrane and in phase one two between this phase here two to three we get an influx that rushing into the cell of more and more calcium and more and more potassium out now what that does is calcium elongates a contraction that's why something the size of your fist can provide cardiac output for the entire body. Uh, also, why if we're in a hyperkalemic event, why we actually give calcium, it makes the or allows the heart to function in hyperkalemic environments. And then phase three here, uh, potassium is furthered out. And then in phase four, phase zero, we kind of get ready to do this all over again. Or this is the phase four is repolarization are getting back to a state of readiness and then we get another rapid influx of sodium. So we're going to talk about antidysrhythmics that go into something called a Von Williams classification. And the Von Williams classification, until we change our understanding of cardiology, are essentially going to work off of one of these things. So we're going to see things like sodium channel blockers, and calcium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers that pretty much decrease conduction velocity in the heart. All right, antiarrhythmic drugs, group one or class ones, uh, decrease the rate of entry of sodium during membrane depolarization. And there's three types of these, a class 1A, 1B, and 1C. Uh, essentially, each one of these attack a little different spot. So 1A depresses phase 0 and prolongs the duration of the action potential. Well, if we'll take a look here really quick, phase 0 was where the sodium was influxing in. 1B 
slightly depresses phase zero and prolongs the duration of the action potential. And in 1C, slightly affects of repolarization but marked depression of phase zero of action potential. Significant slowing of conduction. Now, until about 2000, we thought that this was the way that we should um, treat ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. At that point, we essentially uh, switched to a drug that is a multispectrum antidysrhythmic. The multispectrum antidysrhythmic is, that I'm speaking of is amiodarone. And now it holds a, one of these classes that we're fixing to talk about, but that's not the only thing it does. It also does other things, even though it holds a class 3 rating. And that means it is a potassium channel blocker. So let's start drawing some things in here. So group 1 is sodium channel blocker. <clears throat> a group 2. Um, Block beta adrenergic receptor sites and depress, depress phase four depolarization. Now this is going to be our lols or our beta blockers. A tenolol, low presser, a metatoprol, um, endorol, propanolol, all of the lols. So essentially what we have is we have selective and non-selective of these, but we'll just talk about beta one primarily. And that beta one receptor makes your heart beat harder, faster, and stronger. Now, what the beta blockers do is they block that receptor. So very simply, the heart decreases in rate and decreases in contractile force strength, thereby reducing the rate and reducing myocardial oxygen consumption. A group three, and this is by proper nature. Now, whenever we actually talk about amiodarone, we're going to figure out that it does a lot more than just potassium channel blocking. But to prolong the duration of the relative refractory period, without changing the phase of depolarization of the resting membrane potential. Now, these are going to be drugs like sotalol and amiodarone. And these are, by nature, a potassium channel blocker. Uh, group 4 slows conduction velocity and increases the refractoriness of the AV node. And this is going to be things like verapamil. And these are calcium channel blockers. Okay, so we need to go over this and be sure that this is in our head before we get the next slide. A, a class one is a sodium channel blocker, and it will block the sodium channels in any of those phases that we saw earlier. A class two is a beta blocker, which decreases contractile force strength and conduction velocity, and this would be through the beta adrenergic receptor site. A class three is a potassium channel blocker. Sodium potassium pump is just working on the other side, and this is the new antidysrhythmics like amiodarone. And then a class four, which is a calcium channel blocker. Now this is going to be things like cardiazim, verapamil, and so on. And we'll talk about more calcium channel blockers as we go. But unless we change the way that we understand cardiology, your new antidysrhythmics, even if they come out on the market, are going to fit into one of these classifications. So this is where the classes work. So very simply, a class one works right here in phase zero, where phase four, phase zero, where the sodium rapidly influxes. A class two and we'll do this kind of out of order because these are class three and then a class four. A class two is a beta blocker. And let me get rid of all that. So class one is sodium blocker. Class two is a beta blocker. And that's going to decrease contractile force strength and rate, which will reduce the repolarization rate because of conduction velocity won't be near as great. Uh, a class three is a potassium channel blocker, and then a class four is a calcium channel blocker. Now in the phases, sodium was rapidly influxing in phase zero. In phase one to two to three, this is where calcium was rushing into the cell. And three, uh, potassium, after it, it moved out, was even pumped out a little bit more or started, I'm sorry, my apology, started moving back in at that point and get it ready to do this all over again. And it blocks that. So what we learned from 
I'll clear this off of there, what we learned from the difference between a class one and a class three, if we adjust this, it decreases the amount of action potential that they have to begin with. Well, if they're in the middle of full arrest, we want that to be at its peak. The class three very simply retards the heart and its conduction velocity, thereby calming it down or decreasing the amount of chances that you have to go into VFib or VTAC or decreasing the ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia threshold. Antiarrhythmic drug precautions. Now, all of these medications are going to retard the heart or actually stop it, or not stop it completely, but they will slow down conduction velocity. Can cause toxic side effects that can be confused with the original purpose for administering the drug in the first place. These drugs can cause or worsen arrhythmias very easily. EMS considerations, obtain and document EKG access for palpitations, chest pain, missed beats, fainting episodes. Monitor blood pressure and pulse and avoid heart rates less than 50 or over 120. Now, you should always be cautious. And definitely, if you're already aberrant in your heart rate, you're already on thin ice. Anticoagulations or anticoagulants. Uh, mechanism of action divided into three categories. One, anticoagulants prevent and slow coagulation. Two, thrombolytics, which increase the rate. Clots are dissolved and they're like clot busters. And then three, hemostatics, a prevent or stop internal bleeding, and this would be like TXA. Uh, indication, treat venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolus, uh, acute coronary occlusions like MI and strokes. Contraindications, not used in patients with hemorrhagic tendencies. Does it make sense? So why would we want to mess with their coagulative factors if they're already having hemorrhagic tendencies, like they're hemophiliac or something? Impaired renal function or severe hypertension. If we give them thrombolytics and they're severely hypotensive, there's a good chance we're going to bleed them out. I will explain that more whenever we get to thrombolytics chapter. Uh, EMS considerations, question about gum bleeds, urine, uh, blood in the urine, stools, vomit, and bruises. Apply pressure to all venipuncture and injection sites to prevent bleeding and hematoma. As subcutaneous administration, aspirate and massage injection in lower abdomen and rotate the sites. Anticonvulsants. Mechanism of action on those, they prevent or relieve convulsions or control seizures without impairing normal CNS function. And control seizures without impairing normal CNS function. EMS considerations on this, uh, if they're in respiratory depression or cardiovascular collapse, not the best drug in the world to choose. Note CNS side effects, blurred vision, slurred speech, confusion, muscle twitching, loss of muscle tone, bizarre behavior, and amnesia. And if we're using some of this medication, we also use them as pre-sedation meds. So if we're going to do an intervention like synchronized cardioversion or something like that, we want that amnesic factor in this type of drug. So this is going to be like Versed, Valium. Antidepressants or tricyclics. Mechanism of action. Tricyclic antidepressants cause adaptive changes in serotonin and norepinephrine receptor systems. Generally controls the amount of uptake of these neurotransmitters that we actually have. Result is in change in sensitivity in the, both the presynapsis and postsynaptic receptor sites. And indications on this are endogenous or reactive depression. Contraindications, severely impaired liver functions, acute recovery from an MI or myocardial infarction, or the use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, EMS considerations on these are none. Anti-diabetic drugs, hypoglycemic drugs, oral. Um, mechanism of action, drugs that lower or maintain blood sugar levels and insulin. Uh, hypoglycemics are used with diet and exercise. Oral hypoglycemic agents act by one of the following. Stimulate insulin release, increase the number of insulin receptors, or increase the ability of insulin to combine with the receptors. Um, three, increase glucagon release and hepatic glucose production. Now, the anti-diabetic indications on this, uh, non-insulin dependent, type 2 diabetes, not responding to diet. <clears throat> There's a different 
two different types of diabetics. There's a type 1, which is insulin dependent, and then there is a type 2. The type 1 diabetic requires insulin continuously, and the type 2 diabetic is essentially insulin resistant. So their cells uh, really does not like the insulin that their body produces. So this medication here, these hypoglycemic drugs would create more insulin receptors, make uh, better use of the insulin that the person has in their body and thereby decreasing the resistance. Now even sometimes a type 2 will have to have insulin uh, as supplement. Contraindications on this, fever, infections, pregnancy, insulin dependent diabetes, uh, juvenile diabetes which is essentially type 1, brittle diabetics, impaired endocrine, renal, or liver function. Uh, EMS consideration, gastric upset, please take this with food and do not chew the capsules either. Again, allow them, they're in a nice little skin that goes mostly through the body <coughs> or goes all the way through the body. If you chew it up, you will get too much of a drug. It's kind of sustained release. Anti-diabetic drugs continued here, insulins, and this would be mostly for the type 1s. Mechanism of action facilitates transport of glucose into cardiac, skeletal, and adipose tissue, increases synthesis of glycogen in the liver. Insulin is a protein that destroys that is destroyed by the GI tract. It's administered sub-Q, so it's absorbed by the bloodstream. There are three classifications of insulin. There's rapid acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. Um, rapid acting would be regular insulin. So this is going to onset and durate for about 30 minutes. Uh, intermediate acting, 2 to 4, and then long acting, you can get 24 hour, 12 to 24 hour versions of this. So how long do we want the insulin working would be the question before picking the insulin type. You won't be doing this. This is probably something that your patients will already be on. Indications, replacement therapy for type 1 diabetics, DKA, type 2 diabetics, when other measures have failed. Uh, human insulin is the most, almost, human insulin is used most exclusively. Do not bring down blood sugar faster than 50 milligrams per deciliter per hour. That means we're going to have to, if we're using insulin, we're going to have to take serial finger sticks. Contraindications on this would be hypersensitivity. As far as EMS considerations goes, assess for hyperglycemia, thirst, polydipsia, polyuria, drowsiness, blurred vision, loss of appetite, fruity odor on the breath, flushed skin, assess for hypoglycemia, drowsiness, chills, confusion, anxiety, cold sweats, excessive hunger, nausea, headache, irritability, shakiness, and tachycardia. Antihistamines, H1 blockers, and these are pretty much going to be proton pump uh, given to people for allergies, things like that. <clears throat> um, drugs that block action of the histamine receptor broken down into one, first and second generation. First generation bind to central peripheral H1 receptors, and the second generation tend to be less sedating. Uh, indications on this, allergies, highs, local and systemic hypersensitivity reactions. First generations can also treat insomnia, motion sickness, or vertigo. Contraindications are going to be hypersensitivity, narrow angle glaucoma, and any kind of use with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. <coughs> Antihyperlipidemic drugs or HMG COA reductase inhibitors. This is going to be things like Lipitor to reduce calcium or to reduce cholesterol, my apologies. Uh, mechanism of action, reductase inhibitors increase HDL cholesterol and decrease LDL cholesterol and plasma triglycerides. The maximum response to these drugs is generally seen in about four to six weeks with diet. Indications, adjunct to the diet in patients to decrease elevated total LDL cholesterol. Contraindications, hyper, anti-hyperlipidemic drugs should not be used in pregnant patients children, and in patients with active liver disease. As far as EMS considerations, there are none. Antihypertensive, this is just kind of going into, uh, there's multiple antihypertensive drugs out on the market. So uh, in this slide here, we're just going to talk about what stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3 hypertension is by their um, categorization or their systolic, diastolic pressures, which one would be which. Uh, BP for adults and 18 years or over optimally 
is less than 120 and less than 80 diastolic. The first number would be systolic and the second number would be diastolic millimeters of mercury. The normal is less than 130 over uh, 85. Um, high normal, 130 to 139, over 85 to 89. A stage 1 hypertension would be a systolic pressure of 140 to 159, with a diastolic pressure of 90 to 99. Stage 2 hypertension, 160 to 179 systolic, and then 100 to 109 diastolic. Stage 3, 180 systolic or greater, and then 110 diastolic or greater. Uh, two exceptions for hypertensive for diabetics is uh, anything over 135, over 85, and then in renal insufficiency patients it needs to be less than 130 over 85. And as far as EMS considerations and antihypertensive drugs, we will come into considerations for the specific medications, but there are none in the broad category. Antibiotic drugs. Uh, mechanism of action. There are two classes of antibiotics. Bacteriostatic arrests the multiplication and further development of infectious agents. And then bactericidal drugs kill and eradicate all living organisms. So I set up an environment that does not allow the bacteria to proliferate. That's one. And, or two, I directly attack them. Indication. And this depends on the type of illness and sensitivity of the infection agent and the patients with previous experience with the drug. Contraindications if they're hypersensitive to it. EMS considerations, please monitor their vital signs, assess for hives, rashes, or difficulty breathing, which may indicate that they are hypersensitive, hypersensitive to the drug. Anti-malarial uh, mechanism of action, cause inhibition of the parasite to grow, uh, membrane damage to the parasite, interference with hemoglobin digestion by the parasite, and interference with synthesis of the nucleoprotein by the parasite. Indication, acute ta attacks of malaria. Uh, contraindications, if you're hypersensitive, hypersensitive to the drug, and then no EMS considerations on that one. Anti-malarial drugs are do not, malaria do not proliferate. <clears throat> Anti-neoplastic drugs or chemotherapeutic drugs. Mechanism of action, depending on the type of the tumor and the site of the tumor growth, all are cell poisons affecting both neoplastic and normal cells. And that would be any new cell growth. Very simply, it's going to kill those cells too. Neoplastic cells are more active and multiply more and are more affected by this uh, chemo. Indications prevent growth of malignant cells. Contraindications, any kind of hypersensitivity to the drug first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, EMS considerations are none on this. Uh, antipsychotic drug, phenothiazine, mechanism of action, do not cure the mental illness. They just block the dopamine receptors in the brain, uh, which leads to a reduction of psychotic symptoms and a reduction of LOC. Uh, contraindications, severe CNS depression, seizures, to, uh, anybody that's taking anticonvulsant drugs or have uh, cerebrovascular disorders or cardiovascular disorders, renal disease, glaucoma, uh, children with any kinds of chicken pox, CNS infections, or measles. And as far as EMS considerations, there are none. And we're almost to the end of part one here. So reference to this, we're taking from two locations, Beck's Pharmacology for the EMS Providers by Delmar Learning, and then Brian Bledsoe's Pre-Hospital Emergency Pharmacology, 7th edition. If you have any questions concerning this part one, please feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith, smithrdimsa.net, or 405-219-7613. Thank you.